So um, first off, I just wanted to thank um, the organizers and also the families who donated um, that allowed me to actually start this research. Um, so today I'll talk about um, some kind of preliminary data that we've acquired looking at a GSS transgenic mouse model. And so um, first off, I'll just start with the very basics. So um, in human prion diseases, there's three types. You have sporadic, um, inherited, which is, um, sorry, sporadic's the more, more common with about 85% of people. Um, having that type of um, human prion diseases. Then you have inherited, which is um, um, the familiar point um, types, where you have familial um, CJD, GSS, or fatal um, familial insomnia. And that can uh, um, accompany about 10 to 15 percent of the population with human prion diseases. And what that usually means is that someone will actually have a mutation or a polymorphism in their prion protein. And so that's what most of my talk will be about today, um, so this um, GSS syndrome. And then we also have that small, small um, amount of people that get the acquired version, which is about 1%. So just to, to focus in on GSS, um, GSS, like I said, is a familiar prion disease. It's autosomal dominant, and its mutation is found at the 102 location on the prion protein. And um, like Dr. Telling had mentioned earlier, um, back in the early 90s, there was a transgenic mouse model that was made for this, um, with this mutation. And um, it actually falls on um, the amino acid sequence 101 for the mouse, so it's the corresponding mutation. Um, in these mice, they found in the early 90s that these had the pathology similar to humans with GSS. So you can see here, um, depicted here, um, amyloid, PRP amyloid structures in the, in the brain slice from these mice. So this was um, a very good tool that, was, um, that we have to be able to use, and this was a spontaneous disease in these mice. Um, then later on, in, in 2005, and then another paper in 2007, um, the Telling Group then characterized um, these GSS mice further and um, showed that we could actually accelerate the disease by taking mice, um, taking these TG GSS mice with that mutation, inoculate or expose them to brain material that was um, spontaneous and um, that would accelerate the disease, which is an, an important thing that we can use in the laboratory so that we can accelerate how quickly we can get our results and then hopefully move on to, um, um, to, to the therapies and the diagnostics. And so this is just a graph that we commonly see in prion disease um, research where you have incubation time and then the amount of time that the, the mice actually survive. And this is just a slide showing kind of the readouts or what we would see from these mice. So um, like most, um, in all prion diseases, these mice show spongiform degeneration, which you can see by the holes in these slices from the brains. You can also see inflammation in the brain. So astrogliosis is inflam inflammation of astrocytes, which are the other, one of the other cells found in the brain, so you'll have neurons and astrocytes. And so this is a, a phenotype that, or a pathology that we see a lot in prion disease as well. And then also these mice um, will, when, once they're symptomatic, they also have, um, we can also use a tool to actually detect if they have PRPSC or the misfolded protein. So I know a lot of people have kind of talked about this today, but one of the key points that's happening in um, prion diseases is the normal cellular protein PRPC is a misfolded or a different conformation into PRPSC. And so this is just a, a picture kind of to, um, to, to visualize that. So PRPZ is converted to PRPSC. But what's really known in the field is that if you remove PRPC, so if you have mice that don't express PRPC or can remove it by other methods, then you actually don't get conversion to PRPSC. And so PRPC, the actual cellular form, is thought to be one of the key cellular factors, or it is the key, a key cellular factor in um, getting um, infection or PRPC, SC um, production. 
But um, what's interesting is that there's some cases where you can have um, PRPAC expression in cells or in species. However, there's no conversion to PRPSC. And so this kind of phenomenon we've taken into the lab to try to see if, well, what makes some cells resistant to um, PRPSC formation, even if it still has that PRPC expression. And so for the remaining of my talk, I'll kind of use these um, words interchangeable, where resistant or R cells, so cells that are, um, that are not able to make PRPSC, and then we have cells that are susceptible or sensitive, um, and they will actually make PRPC. SC. So our hypothesis is, along with the prion protein, that there's other unidentified cellular factors that are important in making um, disease or people susceptible and um, that lead to pathogenesis. So the way that we did this in the laboratory was we used a cell um, cell assays, basically. And so as Dr. Telling was saying earlier, we're mostly a chronic wasting disease laboratory, but although we excel, um, look at a ton of other different species. And so what we had was we had these cells that express either deer PRP, elk PRP, or sheep PRP. And so you take these cells, and then I won't go into all the details, but you can basically, um, some of the cells are sensitive and actually express PRPSC when they're exposed to prions, while others are resistant. So it's a really great way to say, okay, and ask the question, well, what makes those cells sensitive and what makes those cells resistant? And so this is just a diagram kind of showing how we set this up. So we have deer, cells expressing deer PRP, elk PRP, or sheep PRP. And then um, from that, you can get S or R cells, so sensitive or resistant. I then take um, genetic material from these cells and um, RNA and actually do um, a really cool laboratory technique to see well, what's going on. So the laboratory technique we use is RNA sequencing, which is basically a snapshot of genetic changes. It's a really, it's a really small chip that's similar to what you find in your digital camera, your memory card. And that basically, you put your RNA on that and then you're able to pull out information about the genetic material. And when you do this, you get lots and lots of different gene changes and um, um, different pathways and things. But through, through um, talking to lots of people and getting to learn this new, new field of bioinformatics and, stat and talking to statisticians and things, we've now pulled down a list that, is app, um, that we're able to work with. So here what I'm showing you is a Venn diagram just with all the gene changes in red that are happening in the elk cells, so sensitive versus resistant changes, all different changes happening in the deer cells, and then the combination of the three deer, elk, and sheep cells. But what was the most um, interesting cells are the ones, most interesting genes are the ones that are changing in the middle that's happening in all of our sets. So again, these are genes that are changing when we look, when I compare um, sensitive versus resistant. And in this 136 genes, there's 108 that are known genes, meaning genes that in the literature they've been um, shown um, to be involved in a, a variety of pathways or functions, while 28 of these genes were actually unknown genes, which are interesting but a little harder to study, of course. So when you do this type of analysis, you can do all sorts of computer programs to fit that spit out pathways that are important. And I won't really go into much detail, I just wanted to show you that um, lots of things are happening with these 108 genes. And so um, it can be kind of overwhelming when you have all these um, lists of genes and things, but I think we've, we've, we're slowly nailing down a couple genes that seem to be important, which um, one of them um, oh yeah, so identification, so what does this all tell us? These genes will hopefully um, allow us to look at insights into disease mechanism. So what makes a cell resistant and what makes a cell sensitive, what's behind that is really interesting. Um, possibly that would then lead to some diagnostics or therapeutics, which um, of course is the goal of, the goal of everyone here, so. So like I said, there's, there's a few genes that seem to be coming really interesting in our list, and one of them is um, HSBP8. 
um, it's a kind of a mouthful, but it increases in our sensitive cells. So this, this gene seems to increase in our sensitive cells and it's not, it's not found or not um, expressed in our resistant cells. So it's really interesting. Um, and so we wanted to study that further. So what, is this, what does this protein do? It's a thought of as being a, chap a chaperone that regulates protein function, so or re regulates protein um, misfolding or not misfolding, I guess. So basically what I'm trying to say is that proteins need, in order to function properly, they must have the proper form. And so what's happened um, in diseases like protein misfolding disorders, you have an, an increase of misfolded proteins like PRPSC. So, um, so it's interesting, and then you have these endogenous cellular pathways like HSPP8 that, oops, sorry, I'm sorry, that are actually there um, their normal protection is to protect cells from stress, um, like misfolded proteins. And also HSPP8 has been shown to be increased in other neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which um, made it also very interesting to us to see if it, would, if it was changing in prion disease and specifically GSS. So here's just a, a pathway diagram of how, what HSPP8 is doing in the cells. And so it acts in three different ways, all on pathways that are um, involved in regulating protein, um, proteins in some way in the cell. And most of them are there in order to help the cells, or they are there to help the cells get rid of bad proteins, such as protosomal degradation, um, which has been shown in prion disease to be not working as properly. So um, that this definitely gives us um, something that we should look at in our, in our cells as well as GSS mice. Um, we have shown before that if you um, look at protein synthesis in prion disease, we actually see a decrease in protein synthesis as well as its pathways like EF2 alpha phosphorylation, which I'll show you in a second more about that. And that seems to be something that we could possibly um, target it for a therapy. So that was really interesting that HSPP8 played a role possibly on that as well. And then HSPP8 can also um, play a role on autophagy, which, which is basically just a way a cell can undergo cell death. So, um, so HSPP8 is playing, could be playing on these three branches in our, in our samples, but definitely something we will be testing. So one of the first things we wanted to do was look at these HSPP8 um, samples that we had, sorry, look at these GSS, mouse samples that we have and see if we see changes of expression levels of HSBP8 like we saw in our cells. And what we see is that when a TG um, GSS mouse is inoculated or exposed to other material, to the, um, another mouse's material, brain material, it, and you look over time, you see that um, before they're clinically sick and have, um, and have prion disease, you do see an increase of HSBP8. So that gave us, um, that was really exciting and something that we wanted to, to keep exploring. So if you kept going down the pathway, so if you, we know that HSBP8 is being expressed in these mice, we then wanted to see, well, do we see EF2 alpha phosphorylation? And again, this is a protein that we had seen previously in other studies in, um, when I was in the Malucci group, that EF2 alpha phosphorylation happens and then um, um, through a variety of other things start to happen and then that causes neuronal loss. So we were, we were um, keen to see if this was happening in these GSS mice as well. And what we found was that indeed, as, at the same time that we see HSBP8 goes up um, in these prion, um, these GSS mice that have been exposed to prion material, that you do see um, an increase of EF to alpha phosphorylation. And um, However, this, this is all really preliminary work and there's, there's definitely more that we want to do. Um, so really addressing, okay, so we know that HSPP8 is changing in our transgenic GSS model. So what, what other parts of its pathway are changing? We know that EF2-alpha is but we don't, we're, we're yet to know what kinase or what's upstream of EF2-alpha, so that's definitely in, the, in progress, 
as well as protein synthesis, which, um, like I said before, has been shown to be important in the prion disease progression. And then it will be important to look at its other components, um, protosomal degradation and autophagy, and then how that all plays a role on neuronal death um, or loss in these mice. And so just quickly, some conclusions. So um, with lots of help from previous lab members and current lab men members, we've established um, a good amount of resistant and sensitive cells that will allow us to screen for new genes and pathways involved um, in making a cell susceptible or resistant to prion disease. Um, we also have HSPP8 levels are up in the transgenic GSS mice, as well as EF2 alpha. So future directions, um, we definitely need to continue our analysis. Like I said, this is preliminary data, and we'd like to get some more, um, or we're in the process of getting more tissue and things to up our, our increase our in and things for the, for the tissue, and um, look more at HSPP8 in its role. And then one of the ways we can do that is we can actually modulate HSPP8 or other genes in the mouse and then look at the readouts that I had so showed before, the things that are um, really well worked out in the telling lab. And then also I think it's really going to be important to continue to look at my list of genes that I mentioned to see if those are changing in GSS as well. Um, I didn't really have time to talk about it, but we, um, we have about six to seven candidate genes that seem to be acting on the same pathway. So it definitely seems like um, a good way to, to, to screen some genes that, and possible bring that to therapy one day. <laughs> So just my acknowledgments, I'd really like to thank um, Dr. Telling, of course, and um, Dr. Besson, he's also at Colorado State. He um, always gives us really good insight into this project as well. Um, there's quite a few people that had done a lot of work on getting the resistant and sensitive cells. Bien, Vadim, and Carla um, were all really key in doing that. Um, also, I have an undergrad, Matt Zabel, who works really closely with me on all my projects, and he's been really helpful. I'd also like, again, to thank the CGD Foundation grant for this, for enabling me to work on this project. Um, I think it's important to note that a grant, a grant like this has allowed us to, to make this a priority to look at, and hopefully some of our results could you know, lead to a bigger grant and um, maybe a NIH grant, so it's really good. And then we have some funding through NIH also to look at the sensitive and resistant cells in more detail. So with that, thank you.